Father in heaven, we ask today that you would please be with your manservant. Bless him in a special way as he speaks through your people. Grant us receptive hearts, and may we all be truly blessed with the message that we would hear today. Thank you so much, Lord, for what you're going to do for each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. <laughs> missed my church family last week. You missed me for two weeks, but I was live streaming <laughs> one week. So, uh, And last week I was in uh, Calhoun, Georgia church. And so... Uh, but anyway, uh, it's really a, a blessing to have the live streaming if you're somewhere else and you can tune in. I, I wish we had uh, sort of a two-way thing, you know, where it'd be neat to see everyone that's tuned in each, each Sabbath. And so I'm very thankful for our live streaming and for the people that watch on live streaming, uh, even when they go to other locations. And so even though I was in uh, <coughs> Marietta, Georgia, I was here too. This, uh, this fall, I've uh, sort of gotten off the beaten path. I had uh, did two sermons on the book of uh, Leviticus, which I've never done before. <laughs> and today, I've, uh, I'm out of the book of Leviticus, but it's uh, on a subject that I've never preached before on either. Truth or consequences, the art of lying. Have you ever heard a sermon on lying, just a sermon on lying? No, I hadn't either, so we're all going to be uh, going through that experience today. Our key scripture today comes from Daniel 8, uh, verse 12, and it's several verses there, and it says, And out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. And he cast what? truth down to the ground he did all this and did what and prospered but verse 25 but he shall be broken without human means today's sermon is a really a critical uh, on a critical subject dealing with the great controversy the great controversy is a cosmic war that we need to be familiar with to avoid being deceived and so the subject matter of today is lying versus truth. Most of you know that lying can be actually a disease, an addiction for some people, but it can have fatal consequences for all of us. And therefore, we need to know all about it and study it so that we are not caught unawares. Now, if you're a military leader, one of the things that you want to know is the weapons that your enemies have. Wouldn't you want to know that? If you're an admiral or general, you want to know what your enemy, what weapons they have to, to uh, use against you. And so we need to be aware of the weapons that Satan is using against us. Studying the strategy that Satan employs through lies is critical for us to understand in this war against supernatural powers in order for us not to be caught in Satan's snare and become one of his eternal fatalities. We need to be familiar with Satan's schemes to defeat us. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 10 and 11, or it says to to keep Satan from taking advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his schemes or his devices. I'm going to get a little bit of exercise from you today. How many of you want to be taken advantage of? Raise your hand. No, no takers? We see in the news practically every day where people have been taken advantage of. A lot of times it's uh, elderly people that are taken advantage of by unscrupulous contractors, especially after natural disasters such as Hurricane Matthew and uh, other uh, hurricanes and uh, again the earthquakes and all that uh, that we see. Unscrupulous contractors will come in and take advantage of people. They'll say, give me uh, 
50% down uh, deposit, and after the people take that money, they're gone. Never see them again. There are people that are IRS impersonators. Have you ever gotten a call from someone pretending to be an IRS agent and wanting money? Or that's one of the more popular um, fraudulent activities that goes on today. And there's other fraudulent individuals that work all the time. They're out there trying to deceive and take advantage of anyone they can. But the best way that we can avoid being taken advantage of is to be aware of the schemes that they hatch. And we need to be aware of the scheme that Satan and his followers employ to deceive us. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, the power of lies. We often underestimate the power of lies, yet it is one of the best, most powerful weapons in Satan's arsenal. You re can recall and remember that this was Lucifer's weapon of choice in sowing the seeds of rebellion in heaven. With this weapon of lying, Lucifer deceived a third of the angels in heaven because they believed his lies. Before we get into our study any further on uh, uh, the subject of lying versus truth, we need to discuss a couple terms. Now, we're very familiar with the term misinformation. Misinformation means it's just wrong information, just not correct. But there's another term that we don't use very often, but it's even more important for us to know the meaning of that. It's called this information, D-I-S information. And disinformation, you'll see on the screen, is false information that is, what's that next word? It's intentionally given in order to make someone or them believe something or to hide the truth. In other words, disinformation is counterfeit truth that is disguised so that it deceives. Disinformation is often a mixture of truth and falsehoods that makes detection even more difficult and less obvious. It distorts the truth and intentionally leads people to a wrong conclusion. Now, most of you have heard of about the thing that we uh, call internet, haven't you? It's a part of our daily life. We carry it around in our pockets and smartphones, and so the internet is uh, pretty uh, much a part of our daily life. It's a source of much knowledge. It also has become the vehicle of choice to disseminate both misinformation and disinformation. The internet has allowed misinformation and disinformation to flourish as never before in history at speeds unheard of in the past. You know, before when we were, uh, I, went, I won't put everybody in that category, when I was a little boy, about the fastest way you could get gossip going around is if you just told your neighbor or you told a friend or uh, that was it. With the internet, it's like an explosion you can tell a thousand people, you can tell two thousand people at the same time anything. There are ads and articles that are cleverly written on the internet that promise wealth, no wrinkles, longevity, a cure for diseases, weight loss products, and various stories that pretend to be true when the aim is actually to deceive gullible readers and viewers into believing something that is actually a lie. And not only does this disinformation or misinformation deceive the reader, that little part of the computer up there that says forward, or that little icon that says share, allows the deceived person to send it to all their friends as well. And the falsehood is then spread exponentially, that is, it just mushrooms. Quite often the information says, send this to 10 of your friends. 
Thus, millions of people can be deceived through the grapevine of the internet by well-intentioned friends in rapid fashion, and the lie is actually perpetuated for years. It's like a wave that comes in. It, it keeps going, and the ripple effect keeps going right through um, the, the entire world. There's also something called, you may have not have heard of it before, it's called the big lie. It's a lie that's just huge and it's so big that most people don't even recognize it as a lie. The big lie appears to have been Adolf Hitler's explanation for how the German people came to believe that Germany lost World War I. Hitler came up with this, quote, big lie. He blamed it on the Jewish influence on the press. Hitler managed to use the big line disinformation to, to turn the German nation into a nation without conscience, which led up to World War II. But Adolf Hitler did not invent lying. Adolf Hitler did not invent disinformation. That title belongs to no other than Satan. Satan invented lying. Again, Satan invented lying. In John 8, 43, 45, Jesus spoke to the Jews and said, Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is what? No truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and... What? The father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. And so you see people believing Satan and rejecting the truth. However, we as Christians are not to be like the rest of the world. We are to be different. We are to be little Christ. That's what Christian means. It's a little Christ that is, we model our lives after Christ. We are to be followers of Christ, seekers of truth. Instead of seeking power and prestige, we are called to be servants. We are called to not only love one another, but to even love who? Our enemies. We as Christians are not to be clamoring for the power, riches, or allurements of the world. We are to have the attitude, as the song goes, this world is not my home, I'm just uh, passing through. Lies are often sugar-coated and are used with adjectives to diminish their true character. Who hasn't heard of a little lie or a white lie? People will stretch the truth. There are half-truths. There are fibs. There are telling stories. There are exaggerations, prevarications, tall tales, crocs, fabrications, Far-fetched stories, misrepresentations, trumped-up stories, whoppers, equivocations, evasiveness, and near truths. There's a show, a television show called, um, uh, or television show called Pretty Little Liars. I haven't watched it, but the song Beautiful Liar actually won the most earth-shattering collaboration award for MTV Music. There's an annual competition in England where competitors come to compete for the world's biggest liar award. This particular competition excludes lawyers and politicians because those occupations are considered too good at lying. In these and other venues, lying is dressed up to be fun and acceptable behavior that is to be encouraged. However, with all this sugarcoating, it's important that Christians recognize lies for what they are, and that they are Satan's lies are one of the most effective weapons that he uses to cause men and women to lose their souls. There's an article uh, recently when I was in, uh, doing, sitting in the hospital room, I caught up on reading. I read and read and read and read and read and read. And read. Not much to divert your attention there. One of the things that I read was in Time Magazine on October 24th, and the uh, title of this 
article the fascinating reason why liars keep on lying. I'm going to share this, some interesting stuff here because, you know, you really can't fight something unless you know what it's like. We need to understand lying and the source of it and how it works with us, you know. It, once a liar, always a liar, the old saying goes. Turns out there's some scientific truth to that. Researchers have tracked down how the brain makes lying easier as the untruths build up providing some biological evidence for why small lies often balloon into even larger ones. Tally Chereau from the Department of Experimental Psychology at University College London and her colleagues, they found that when people were dishonest, activity in a part of their brain called the amyg amygdala, yeah, that's right, the hub of the emotional processing and arousal changed. With each scenario, the more dishonestly the participant advised his partner, the less activated the amygdala was on the MRI. That may be, cause, be because lying triggers emotional arousal and activates the amygdala. But with each, this is important, with each additional lie, the arousal and conflict of telling an untruth diminishes. That is, it's easier and easier to tell a lie making it easier to lie. Sherrod also found that the amygdala became less active mostly when people lied to benefit themselves. In other words, self-interest seems to fuel dishonesty. The researchers were even able to map out how each lie led to less amygdala activation and found that the decrease could predict how much the person's dishonesty would escalate in the next trial. Biology seems to back up the warnings parents give to their kids that one lie just leads to another. Now, there's some powerful stuff there that, that gives us some insight into lying. I think that practically everyone has been guilty of lying at some time in their life. We're well acquainted with lying or being exposed to the lies from the time that we're little kids until we're very old. Even some of the great Bible characters that we read about were guilty of lying at various times. Abraham said that his sister, or that Sarah was his sister, which was a half-truth, but he was intending to deceive. We find that David lied, Peter lied, Jacob lied, Joseph's brothers lied, and the list goes on and on. However, it is important to know that the individuals that we just named repented of their sins and asked for forgiveness, and God forgave them. And likewise, we should ask God for forgiveness and also forgive those who lie to us and repent of their activities. You see, truth and lies have been hot topics during this uh, state and national political season, hasn't it? I believe that this election has been even more sharply divided than those in the past. It seems that politicians will say almost anything or promise almost anything, even promises that they know they cannot keep. They slander each other. They hate each other. Their devotees sometimes hate each other. No wonder that our country is so divided and has so many different factions at work. Most politicians accept lying and deception as just part of the political game plan to uh, get elected. Quite a few of the election ads that we see or read or hear only have partial truth in them, but it's aimed at distorting and deceiving us, distorting the truth. It seems that anything goes to be elected. Doug Thompson wrote, he says, disinformation is a fact of life in politics. Those who practice politics for a living call it spin. You know, it's the spin they put on things. Said, I like this word. He says that honest people call this, that is the disinformation in politics, honest people call it lying through your teeth. <laughs> I like that phrase. We find that even presidents of our country have been guilty of disinformation and lying. In 2011, there's a guy named Michael Sweeney. He wrote an interesting article on 25 ways to suppress the truth. 
the rules of disinformation. Now, I'm not going through all 25 of them, but I picked out a few of them here. And see if these, you can make connections to the political ads that you see or the, the world that we live in. One of his rules is to manufacture a brand new truth. Quote, this is it. Not a new truth, but a new truth. Make up something, in other words. Fit the facts to alternate conclusions. Change the subject. Create bigger distractions. Provide false evidence. Ignore proof presented. Demand impossible proofs. Emotionalize, antagonize, and goad upon opponents. And I could go down, but don't have a lot to uh, a lot of time to go through all these. But it's very, very interesting. If you go through the entire list, though, you find that apparently a lot of politicians and their, their uh, people that work on the campaigns read his article and use his tactics, or the tactics that we just talked about. God is, a, and the Bible is a book of contrast, though, and we're not going to spend the entire sermon talking about lying. We're going to talk about God, and God is truth. We need to respect people and their beliefs, for many are deceived in this world that we live in. We can be deceived. But we have to recognize that we have a great responsibility to show and to tell others about our one true God. His, God, his truth is not all over the place. Truth does not change with the, the, um, the weather. It is timeless. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, as Jesus said to him, I'm the way, what? The truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then Malachi 3, 6, God says, for I am the Lord, I, what? Do not change. Truth is truth. There are no shades of truth despite some claims to the contrary. Satan and his followers have made a profession of distorting God's truth which is really a distortion of God's character, for God is truth. In other words, they've lied about God and his truth. What is truth? The word truth comes to us from an old English word, trioth, which means fidelity, faithfulness. Truth is defined as the true or actual state of the matter or reality. Conformity with fact and honesty and integrity, the state of character of being true and not false. God inspired men to write quite a bit on, about the importance of truth in the great plan of salvation. The word truth occurs 224 times in the King James translation of the scriptures. In 2 Thessalonians 2 here, I'd like for us to, to read this passage. It says, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and what? Lying wonders and with all unrighteous what? Deception among those who perish. Because, this is very important for us to put in our brains to, to uh, just make it a part of our very being. Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Verse 11, and for this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie and that they all may be condemned who did not believe, believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification, sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Satan has lied down through the ages along with all those that follow him. Those who do not believe and love the truth will be deceived and lost. But we need to pray for love of the truth for us and for them that we might be saved through the sanctifying power of the Spirit working within us. 1 John 1, 6 says, If we say that we have fellowship with him, that is with Christ, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. As Christians, we are to cherish the truth as found in the scriptures. We are to cherish truth in our dealings with others. There's a quote here from the great controversy I'd like to share with you. <clears throat> the position that it is of no consequence what men believe is one of Satan's most successful what? Deceptions. 
He knows that the truth received in the, and the love of it sanctifies the soul of the receiver. Therefore, he constantly is seeking to substitute false theories, fables, another gospel. From the beginning, the servants of God have contended against false teachers, not merely as vicious men, but as inculcators of falsehoods that were what? Fatal to the soul. You see, Satan is attacking on every front because he knows that his time is growing shorter each day. He seeks to divide nations. He seeks to divide our country. He seeks to divide our families. He deceit, seeks to divide his church, God's church. If he can introduce elements that will lead to division and quarreling and separation, Satan is successful. He hinders the church's work of spreading the gospel throughout the world. Satan wants to bring elements of world strife into the church. And you can see it in the different Christian churches, even in the Adventist church where different factions will try to promote themselves and to bring division. It's like our, our text that we had to, today. When we see strife and division, even in our church, what are we to do? Run from it, not to entertain it. It's what God's word tells us. Satan wants to bring tolerance and acceptance for groups whose lifestyles are outside God's word. He wants to water down doctrines, distort true doctrines, and even do away with doctrines for the sake of Christian unity, in quotes. Satan wants us to be in, so involved with the things of the world that we will be called unprepared for Jesus' second coming. He's the author of confusion in the physical and spiritual realms. Satan blames God for all the calamities that he actually creates. Ephesians 4.14, it says, So then we may no longer be children tossed like ships to and fro between chance gust of teaching and wavering with every changing wind of doctrine, the prey of the cunning and cleverness of unscrupulous men in every shifting form of trickery in inventing errors to mislead. Today we're faced with a lot of half-truths floating around in Christian circles. You see, half-truths are pretty good counterfeits. Satan is a master of half-truths. Sin entered this world through half-truths and deception. The temptations presented to Jesus in the wilderness were half-truths from Scripture. These half-truths, these counterfeit teachings have continued down through the centuries, deceiving millions and millions of people. I think the following statement is true. What is truth is not always popular, and what is popular is not always truth. In other words, don't follow the crowd or what just seems to be the popular thing to do. Psalm 86, 11 says, Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Matthew 22, 16. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. You see, God's truth is a matter of eternal life for us to know and accept. How many variations of truth are there in the eyes of God, and how will God treat those who teach half-truths and claim, it, claim to be his followers? We need to look at 2 Peter, the second chapter, verse 1. It says, But also in those days there arose false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among yourselves who will subtly and stealthily introduce heretical doctrines or destructive heresies, even denying and disowning the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And what's that next word? Many will follow their de destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. You know, again, the, the Bible is a wonderful book of contrast. All the inhabitants of the world will be placed in two different camps, one the saved and one the lost, those who have believed and obeyed and trusted completely in God and those who have rejected and rebelled against God. 
Revelation 22, 14. Jesus testifies to the churches, as blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and that's where it, here it is, right? There's a little bit more here. In that same classification of the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. In conclusion, whether we follow truth or whether we allow ourselves to be deceived by lies has eternal consequences for us. Some presume that God will accept anything and they think that just about everybody's going to go to heaven. The Holy Scriptures inspired by God do not teach that. We're to learn a lesson from the Garden of Eden and through the history of mankind. God does not condone disobedience, even if it's based on a lie and deception. God does not condone false teaching and, and doctrines. He has warned us many times about these things. And so we need to be diligent. We need to search the Word of God. We need to pray for clear understanding. We should pray that we will not be deceived. Let me just ask you a question. If you've ever been deceived, raise your hand. If, you ever, if you've never been deceived, I don't see who these individuals are. I don't see a single hand. We should uh, think about that a little bit. We've been deceived before. We don't like that, do we? How do you prepare? How do you avoid being deceived? You investigate. And you investigate God's word. You don't just listen to what the neighbor says or the guy on television. Just because it's three million people watching them does not mean he's telling the truth. We have to investigate ourselves. The last uh, slide and comment that I wanted to share was something from Testimonies, Volume 5. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsakes us, to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be our test. You know, it's, it's easy to be a part of a big crowd. It's easy to, you know, when you feel like, you know, there's lots of people around. But it's just like Elijah, you know, he felt like he was the only one left in Israel. You know, and God says, you know, I've got 7,000 that have not bowed to Baal. We may feel like that before the very end of time, that we almost are by ourselves. But we need to cling to God's promises that he will be with us to the very end if we're faithful. Our closing song today is uh, number 294.